so I did all of that uh, for a few years. Um, went to Germany and in again in, in the difference between um, Britain and Germany in those days was you know culturally completely different. Yeah, um, a lot of the soldiers who came back from Germany mm -hmm. uh, were complaining about the uh, back to the UK from Germany. Yeah, were complaining about the beer. You know, the beer here is not as good as it is in Germany. It's really bad. Yeah. I wish somebody would bring in proper beer. Yeah. And, and I thought to myself, aye, aye, there's an opportunity here. So I asked, so in the army you have what's called junior ranks club, then you've got a sergeant's mess, and then you've got the officer's mess. Yeah. And the junior ranks club is is all the soldiers, and they all drink beer, right? They do. They just all drink beer. Yeah. And later on they'll have dark rum, whiskey, vodka, all that kind of stuff. The sergeant's mess, slightly more, you know, slightly better. They will have a, a mixture of things, but they'll also have wine. And yeah. then in the officer's mess, it will generally be gin and tonics and wine. That's That was kind of the that was the, the, the way it was divided up. So uh, I went round a number of junior ranks clubs and said, if I can bring over some beer from Germany, how many would you want? And they said, oh, we'll take 50 cases or... Yeah. 40 cases or 100 cases or whatever. So by the time I added it all up, it was, you know, as you can imagine, it was quite a substantial order for, yeah, yeah. for most of Scotland, right? Uh, and then I started thinking I could sell it to England, army branches in England as well, mm. you know. Okay, let me see about this. Yeah. So I had this, effectively had this order for um, what worked out to be two 40-foot containers of beer. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I thought, right, okay, spoke to the junior rights, spoke to the sergeant's mess, and I said to them, well, I can supply the beer. And uh, under military rules, they had to pay for it when it was delivered. Right? Mm. All right. So I thought, well, I'm going to get I'm going to get this beer. I'll get the money for it. And when I spoke to the suppliers in Germany, they, they had given me 60 days credit. So mm. 60 days to pay for the beer. So I would be able to collect all the money. The money, yeah. With 60 okay. days before I'd have to pay the... The, you know the supplier so i placed an order then for i can't remember what the number was but it was <laughs> something like ten thousand cases of, of yeah. german beer okay yeah. called furstenberg and uh, because i placed such a large order they threw in a whole load of freebies ah. <laughs> um, glasses with the logo on beer mats yeah. beer towels um, bottle openers, you know, you, you you imagine all the stuff that comes with it. So there was yeah. about containers worth of stuff that came with <laughs> it, uh, uh, all the stuff that I was getting for free. Yeah. And um, they also did things like if you, you know, when you ordered so many cases, you got, so if you order 100 cases, you got 10 cases free. You know, this, so, yeah. So I didn't know any of this. I just, <laughs> just placed an order for some beer and you, you yeah. just Deliver. I mean, I was in the Royal Court of Transport, so delivery wasn't an issue. An issue, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you would just deliver all this beer and um, and then collect the money same day, put the money into the bank, mm -hmm. and then pay the supplier. Yeah. So I didn't have a business bank account. I didn't have a business name. I had nothing. I only had my own bank account. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't think about any of the implications of the of any of this. I mean, I'd placed the order. They'd accepted mm -hmm. the order. Yeah. Uh, came from me i was an army officer it was germany germany knew how the thing worked yeah uh, you know they knew they weren't going to be paid by the ministry of defense it was me that was placing it and, yeah and this was a chance for them to get their their product yeah. in, into a new market yeah so mm. i thought you know it was it was win all round so that was it i was now well okay i'm now in the beer importing business yeah <laughs> how hard can it be yeah. um and so the, the, the order duly arrived, and I went down with um, a truck to collect it. Not me driving the truck. A couple of guys were we, – we had a couple of trucks yeah. uh, to take away this – not the 40-foot container, but to take away a lot of it Yeah, uh, because it would stay in um, a bonded warehouse mm -hmm. until you paid for it. Well, I know that now, but I didn't know that then. Yeah. <laughs> so I went down, tr t turned up at the bonded warehouse and said, hi, my name is, I'm here to collect my beer. See? Mm -hmm. And the man with the clipboard and the fluorescent jacket, I don't think he had a fluorescent jacket, but you can imagine, the man with the clipboard. Yeah. Well, um, yep, yeah, okay, here you go. And he handed me this bit of paper, which was for duty and VAT. 
Yeah. I had to pay up front. Uh-huh. Well, I didn't know this, you see. Yeah. Well, I said, I've got a what what? No, but that's my beer there. I've got 60 days credit with a supplier. You don't understand, right? Mm-hmm. I can get the money today. If you let me take it, I can take it and I get the money today. And he's like, son, this isn't how it works. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So suddenly there was this massive hole in the finances because I thought yeah. I think they wanted something like eight thousand pounds. Wow. <laughs> which was the equivalent it's the equivalent now of about 30,000, I think. 30, uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah. they wanted that. Of course, I didn't have it. Nothing like it. Yeah. You know, I had a, I can't remember what I had in my account. I had a couple of thousand, but not, not huge amounts. Um, so I didn't have it. So I had to go to my bank. And my mm. bank uh, in Edinburgh was um, uh, the Clydesdale Bank. Yeah. Hill, a corner mm. branch. The manager there was Mr. Norman Wilson. Mm-hmm. He, knew me, he knew my father, you know, I had an account there since I was five years old, saving up, you know, yeah. my job money and that sort of thing. So he, he'd seen some activity, put it that yeah. way. Yeah. But when I went to see him and I said, um, told him what the story was, he, he sort of looked at me and I remember he looked over his glasses like that. <laughs> so you're telling me you need £8,000 yeah, for yeah. beer? I said, yes. Uh, have you got a business name or a business? Who have, you, who have you got your business account with? I said, I don't have a business account. Yeah. You don't have a business account. <laughs> you have to open a business account here for you. I said, mm. Yeah. Uh, you know, I need to get this beer. I need. And he said, Where's this £8,000 coming from? And I said, Well, you're a bank. Lend it to me. Yeah, absolutely. Said, well, that's not quite how it works. But he said, Right, okay. Right. Oh, and, and where is this stuff? I said, it's sitting in the bonded warehouse in Leith right now, and there's a lorry down there waiting to take yeah. it away. Okay. He's like, well, you want to take it today? You want £8,000 today? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so he said, right, okay. Um, and he shouted through to one of the women in the next room, you know, like, yeah, Jeanette, right, open an account for Mr. McLennan. And he said, what, yeah. do you want to call, what do you want to call your business? And I went, I don't know. <laughs> so I called it, I called it, R and M contracts or something like that. I can't remember. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I should have thought of beer distribution or something. I don't know, but I just, I just went. Look, open an account. My initials. Mm-hmm. So, um, my so use my initials. Opened an account. Mm-hmm. Um, brought out the, the woman brought out a little checkbook which had six checks in it. Yeah. Handwritten at the bottom of the checkbook, the sorting code of the bank. Yeah. And the account number. So yeah. handwritten. Handwritten, <laughs> but he said to me, he said, "Look, he says you can't, you can't give uh, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. You can't give them a check. You have to give them a, a banker's draft." Mm-hmm. So I said, well, what's that? And he said, "Right, okay. What's well, so it's? It's basically a money order that guarantees the money." Yeah. So he says, "We'll open an account for you." He says, "We'll give you an overdraft facility mm-hmm. for for eight thousand pounds, and I'll give you a banker's draft." And he said, "Now I need you to sign this." Letter. So he, he, the manager, sat down at an old typewriter and he yeah. typed up, right? Yeah. Called an irrevocable mandate. And mm-hmm. it, said, it, it had my name on it. And I said, I hereby irrevocably guarantee to repay the bank the sum of £8,000, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I had to sign it with a pen, but I had to write the words adopted as holograph and then sign my name. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This was under the Requirements of Writing Act, yeah, <laughs> 1995 or something. It was repealed, uh, but I had to write this out. This adopted as holograph. So he he now had his guarantee, if you like. Yeah, he, had, he handed me the banker's draft, and I went off to get the beer. Wow! So I arrived a couple of hours later to to the drivers who were a bit a bit annoyed at the time. Oh, yeah. And I handed this bank draft over to the customs guy, and he went, now you can take your beer away, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I just went, we drove around, dropping off this beer, collecting the money, yeah. and we went back to the bank. Mm-hmm. And I think about three or four days later, I now had 8,000 surplus in the bank, having yeah. paid back the 8,000. Yeah. I had the surplus, and I had enough money to pay the German the supplier German. for the beer. Yeah. Uh, and that was it. I was in the, the beer importing business. Wow. <laughs> it's brilliant. So there we go. <clears throat> so that led to, um, well, the officers didn't want beer. They wanted wine. Yeah. So they had been buying 
buying their wine from some local supplier and i i thought well i'll, I'll see if i can do any better because bear yeah. in mind I, I had no big organization i didn't have offices i didn't yeah. have staff i had nothing like that mm -hmm. um i mean to place an order in those days what all you needed was access to a telex machine yeah uh -huh. right? a telex machine which is like a sort of business fax before yeah. fax machines really took off yeah. um, so you could you could I mean, even phoning up and speaking to a company in Germany in those days was was kind of a, a real nuisance, you know. It, mm -hmm. I mean, it obviously could be done, but it wasn't as simple as it is now. Yeah, yeah. And everything, everything was done in writing, and it had to be by telex. Mm. You had to have a telex number, and then you had to send the order through. Yeah. So my, my sister by now was married to a guy who worked in a shipping company, mm -hmm. worked for a shipping agency. Yeah. He had access to a to a telex machine. Telex. Yeah. <laughs> Let me use the telex machine to place the orders. Yeah, and of course, it made me look like I had an office and everything as well. You know, when the yeah. telex yeah. was going, um, and when I was on the phone, you could hear people in the background and all that kind. And so, I think yeah. they had the impression that I had an organisation. Yeah, it didn't. It was just me. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I found a, a, a wine supplier. Again, German wine. They love mm -hmm. they love the German wine. I got to know German wines. Yeah. Well, I did some. I went to visit some German, um, you know, wineries where they make the wine and vineyards and that sort of thing, which was all great. Yeah. And uh, started to supply, um, you know, officers with with wine, mm -hmm. and it, it, but it wasn't as good as the beer. I mean, the beer was bigger orders, much yeah. more profit. The wine there wasn't as much profit in it. Yeah, um, you know, uh, an officer's mess might take two cases or three cases of beer. I mean, they weren't raging alcoholics or anything. They weren't yeah. drinking. When there was a, a dinner on, if there was a big event, then yeah. that that would be good. But it mostly consisted of an officer saying to me, "I'd, I'd like a case of beer, a case of wine for myself, please." Mm. Like, right? Okay. Now, and I, 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 this stuff wasn't stored anywhere. When it got to the bonded warehouse, I would take it out of the warehouse and then take it to wherever it was going. But you had to pay for it while it was in the warehouse. So the longer it stayed there, the more money it cost you. Yeah. yeah. So I started then thinking, well, I need to get somewhere to keep this. I need some storage. Some just I started to think differently about storage distribution, that sort of thing. And mm -hmm. then um, a, a, a guy asked me if I would supply his restaurant. It's just mm -hmm. a guy I got to know. So I started supplying restaurants. Yeah. And that one thing led to another. So then I ended up with a, a, a an actual physical location and and then started selling beer and wine retail as well as wholesale. You get more money for it. I took on an employee and the employee, uh, and her name was Frances. Mm -hmm. uh, Frances was uh, brilliant. She was uh, very very loud, very outgoing, very gregarious, wonderful woman. She's still around. I mean, I'll tell her about this podcast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but she now works uh, in Edinburgh for a company that does service to accommodation. So yeah. I met her again recently. You know, she, she was my first employee, as it were. Yeah. And, um, and one thing that Frances uh, had was a real ability to sell. To she, sell. Had, she had the gift of the gab. She was brilliant. Yeah. Uh -huh. And she came to me and she said, to, uh, one day I remember she said to me, she said, how, um, how much would 100 cases of champagne cost? Mm. And I said, you've sold 100 cases of champagne? She said, yeah. Wow. I said, yeah. I said, well, <laughs> what price did you quote them? She said, oh, they, they told me what they were paying. And I just kind of undercut it by a bit. Yeah. And mm. I said, well, let's, let's, go, let's go and find out, right? Mm -hmm. So it turns out that, it was a wonderful deal. I mean, yeah. a brilliant, brilliant deal. Mm. But what uh, Francis got this regular order for champagne, and I said, "How you know who's buying this champagne?" <laughs> Francis knew just about everyone in the gay community, ah. and they all loved champagne. Champagne, yeah. And they loved Francis, and they loved our champagne because you couldn't get it anywhere else because. We went to a supplier who didn't have a big enough distribution to justify, you know, putting it anywhere else. Mm. So uh, we got it, you know, at a very, very good price. It was a, a champagne you could not buy in any of, you know, if you went into any of the wine shops or supermarkets, yeah. you never saw this champagne. So mm. nobody could, you know, they, they couldn't say, well, it's that's the price of the champagne because I've seen it somewhere else. Yeah. yeah. They just couldn't say that. 
you know, Moet de Chandon seems to be everywhere, you know? Yeah. Who knows the price of a bottle of Moet? Yeah. You know, in a supermarket or in a restaurant, everyone knows the price. The price, yeah. But this champagne, nobody knew the price of. So, of course, we were getting fabulous markups on it. Mm. And, and that, that was that was that was the wine business yeah <laughs> and we also supplied some restaurants as well so yeah. um that, that 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 then led to me getting in the restaurant business yeah. um and because one of the restaurants owed me a bit of money couldn't pay me and he said look i can give you the keys to one of the restaurants if you like mm. so i thought well how hard can it be to run a restaurant yeah, and I, I was now in the restaurant business <laughs> Uh, that, that led to um, another restaurant, yeah, second one, and then I was a bit sort of running around like a headless chicken because now it was kind of you know running a restaurant is a much harder work than having beer or wine distribution. Beer or wine distribution is quite easy. It's very it's quite Monday to Friday nine to five. Mm. But as a restaurant, it's not it absolutely is not. It's, yeah. it's virtually uh, you know virtually eighteen hours a day. Mm. So that was quite tough. And um, I, I then was trying to do everything and running around like a headless chicken and was completely unaware of anything like proper, I mean, even despite being in the army, I, I didn't really have proper systems and processes in place. Yeah. For Although I did. I mean, I'd left the army by this time, but um, I, you can't run a business like you run a military unit. It doesn't yeah. work that way because th there's not the same structure and hierarchy. It requires yeah. a completely different approach. Mm. I didn't really appreciate that until uh, I, I tried to do everything myself. I had no one to delegate to. Yeah. Really. So um, I was a bit bedraggled by this, but I went to see an accountant who was a member of an organization called the Results Accountant Network, R-A-N, mm. and gave me a, a book called The E-Myth by Michael Gerber, mm -hmm. which, uh, you know, The Entrepreneurial Myth. Yeah. Which, which is basically there are uh, technicians and then there are managers and you need to learn to work on the business, not in the business. Yeah. So yeah. I was very really much working uh, in the business, not on the business. Yeah. He said, look, there are systems processes, set the whole thing out. Um, and, and it became so much easier after that. Mm. So much easier after that. So um, I ended up uh, many running a number of restaurants for a number of years and then eg exiting that when, um, when I, I suppose the, the property values and the value of the leases was higher than the profit margin from the restaurant and people were offering money for that. Yeah. Um, and also the organization that I'd sort of plugged in with because it, it was a sort of quasi franchise by now, mm -hmm. not that I was a franchisee under their banner rather than me trying to run the restaurants. And they were, they were, you know, we'd come into another recession and they weren't doing quite so well. So I'd received um, a lot of offers to do different things yeah. with my, my newfound skills so that I exited the restaurant business probably mm. at the right time. Mm. And then I thought, well, what am I going to do with myself? So I, I was kind of, I had a bit, I lost direction for a bit after that. And, and then I decided to do a law degree. Yeah. The reason I decided to do a law degree is going back to my father um, when I left school and I didn't go to university, mm -hmm. uh, he was quite annoyed by that because he said you would have been the first in our family ever to have gone to university oh, and, you had the chance and you didn't take it. So he was yeah. quite annoyed. He was quite annoyed at me mm -hmm. and he'd had this grudge for quite a while and he'd never actually said to me until, until sort of it came down to it now. And I was, you know, mm -hmm. a, bit, a bit, a bit rudderless. Yeah. And that, Combined, actually, with him, um, he had he had bought a, a, a new property. Him and my mother had bought this new property, and it was in in a, a block with a lots of other flats that kind of down. You know, we're getting older now, and they were downsizing. They'd yeah. gone from a huge house, which sold to this much smaller one. Yeah, and uh, because it was a new building, it uh, they got their first rates bill, their first council tax bill. Yeah, and when I he I remember he looked at it and he said, "That seems awful high." That's a big bill. Yeah. You know, I took a look at it and I thought, yes, it is actually. And I started getting getting comparisons from places around and um and then I thought, right, you know, I think you should appeal this. So because it was the first bill, you have six months in which to, to lodge an appeal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I sat down and, and lodged an appeal for him. Mm -hmm. And the uh, you just appealed to the council. 
Yeah. About a banding. You know, you've got band A, B, C, D, E, yeah. um, F, G, or something like that. And then the banding was taken from a census in 1991, I think. So if the value of your house in 1991 was 20,000, you were yeah. in. And if it was 40,000, you were in a, you, you know, the higher the value, the more council tax you paid. Mm. So I thought his was in the wrong banding. Yeah. Two, you know, by two bands. Yeah. Which, a lot of money. I mean, it was a difference of about something like a thousand pounds a year of a difference or something. Wow, that's so, so it was worth doing. Now, there were 20 properties in this block. So um, I, I went to them and at some of them and I said, look, you know, this is what we should do. We should do this. We should get a lawyer to do it. And yeah. they were all like, oh, no, no, no. You know, there was nobody really wanted to, to do it. They were like, well, if you want to do it, that's great. But no, we're not paying anything. So I thought, right, okay, well, spoke to a lawyer about doing it and they quoted us ridiculous amounts of money, you know, yeah. for doing this appeal because mm. the council had rejected it. So now we had to go to court to present. Yeah. So I thought, well, how hard can it be? <laughs> I'll do it. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I'll just pull yeah. this thing together and I'll do it. Yeah. Um, you know, why not? So, uh, so I sat down and I constructed this legal challenge. Yeah. <laughs> We went to court. We went to court. Yeah. Uh, but because it was council tax, things like that, it wasn't a court with a normal judge sitting there with a wig on and a red robe or anything like that. There yeah. was there was one uh, lawyer appointed by the panel or whatever it was, and then there was something like seven or eight other lay people who would hear mm -hmm. your hear your challenge. Okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there was me and my father sat on the right hand side, and over on the left hand side was the local council. Yeah, the local council had two or three advocates, barristers, mm -hmm. to present their case. Mm. So we sat there. We weren't first on the docket. There were several um, uh, cases before us. Yeah. Mm. So we listened to the cases before us. That's mm. my phone going off over there. It'll probably go off forever. The home phone never goes off. It just no. <laughs> going off now. Yeah. So you're all right with that in the background. I don't know. Can you hear yeah. it? That's fine. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. It, it will just go off. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. So uh, we're there, and cases went before us. So mm -hmm. the first couple of cases, somebody stood up, and a lawyer and went, I represent Mr. and Mrs. Smith from such and such a place, and they think they've been wrongly judged. And, and it was all very much like this. And yes, Your Honor, and uh, we put it to you, and it was all this sort of carry on. And then the council guys would get up, and they'd say, no, here's a court, here's a case. Uh, under under this case, that case, the next case, it doesn't stack up. Okay. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. uh, so the panel would then go right. Okay. Well, blah, 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 and they would mumble and chat to each other and go, "What do you think?" And then they go, "Right. Okay. Well, we we find in favour of the council." Yeah. So Mr. and Mrs. Smith and their lawyer would slink off. They'd be, like, "Oh, we yeah. lost." <laughs> and this happened time after time, and we we're sat there, and I thought, I looked at my dad, and I thought, I don't, I think we we're going to lose this. They're just going to, yeah. you know, but. While I was there and I had my old thing together, something the barrister had said in an earlier case, mm. he'd have to contradict for our case. Okay? Um. He'd, have to contradict. he'd have to lie effectively. Mm. So I thought, I might catch him out on this. So I'd prepared the case, but I also prepared, you know, big boards showing the map of the building, something yeah. other had. Everything they had was black and white and words. But mm. I created a few of these sort of whiteboards. Yeah, stuck pictures on, so I stuck pictures of comparisons because I'd never been. I didn't know how it worked. Mm. So I showed them a compare. Held up this whiteboard which had our, this is our property. Yeah, and here's the map, and that's where it is on the map. Mm -hmm. and I handed it up to the panel to take a look at, and I was getting out of my seat and walking up towards them and everything, and you could hear the others mumbling, going, "This is a bit out of order. I'm not quite yeah. sure." Do this. <laughs> Terrible, you know, but, but I was walking up to them and going, oh, you can see here, because they were not judges or lawyers. They were lay people. They were going, oh, yeah, we see what you mean. Yeah, all right, okay. And mm. I showed the comparison property. So I said, so what they're trying to do is they're comparing our house to this house, and, the, and there was this palace. Yeah. I said, but we're actually this house, and it wasn't quite a palace. Yeah. See? So they want us to pay the palace prices for yeah. the normal house. And I think that's, you know, uh, that's, that's not fair. Yeah. Anyway, then their lawyer got up and he did. He basically contradicted himself. And I thought, I've got him. Yeah. So my chance came back and I said, well, I, I you know, I heard what the honorable gentleman or whatever you called it or whatever it was uh, yeah. had said um, a few. I, I heard what he'd said 
in a previous case. Yeah. But he's now contradicting himself uh, because he said this. Yeah. In that case, and now he's saying this in our case, and it's completely wrong. So either one or the other is wrong. So yeah. if you found in favour of them, the, the, the council, for the earlier case, yeah. then logically you have to find in favour of us now for this case. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Now, yeah. Anyway, they muttered and murmured, and, and they got up and they went out of the room mm. to their verdict, you see. And yeah. I'm sad. My, just me and my dad on one side yeah. the army of lawyers on the other side yeah. <laughs> so the, the people came back in and sat down and they said um, well we've considered this closely and taken all the merits and of course I'm sitting there going I'll get to it you know you're yeah. going to the verdict. you think they're going to turn around and, and the way they, they, they put it they sort of I've, we've heard the arguments from the council and it sways in favour of the council and then but yeah. then arguments from Mr. McLennan and it sways back and you and you don't know which way it's going to go. Yeah. <laughs> and then all of a sudden they say, so at the end of the day, we find in favour of Mr. McLennan. Gavel. Uh, wow. <laughs> anyway, I looked across at the advocate for the council yeah. and he literally looked like he just choked on his lunch. Yeah. I looked across and he went like, yeah, okay, all right, you know, like, but it was a wonderful yeah. victory. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. So, cool. We came out, my dad's like, right, that's it. We're going to celebrate. This is fantastic. You know, yeah. we, ha we hadn't only saved my father a thousand pounds a year, but everyone else in the block because they would yeah. all be banded. Yeah. yeah. So I thought, well, they're all going to be hugely grateful. We're going to get, you know, loads of presents, loads of gifts, all this kind of carry on. And it'll be great. No, we didn't. <laughs> I think one person sent uh, sent me a bottle of wine or something like that. It just saved yeah. them a hand a year. Wow. wow. Opportunity for the rest, you know. This was yeah. a phenomenal verdict. Yeah. And I got we're all for it. But uh, anyway, <laughs> the upshot was my dad turned to me and he went, You're a natural son. He yeah. Said, this, wow. this is the life for you. And I and I thought, well, actually it is. And it combined with a lawyer uh, uh, that I fell out with. Mm. who had presented a bill to me, which was much bigger than I expected, for s the sale of some of the restaurant premises. Yeah. Uh, and he'd said something like, because I said, a lawyer, look at this money you're charging me. It's ridiculous. You haven't done anything. And mm. he said, well, you think being a lawyer is easy. You should do it. So the mm. combination of those two things, yeah. that's, why, that's why I did the law degree. Yeah. So yeah. I went and became a lawyer. Um and uh, having having become a lawyer, I, I did law for a, a, not 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 a long time mm. because I was stifled by the whole l legal industry. Yeah, and so much so that I ended up writing a book called "No Business for Old Men: The Future of the Legal Profession." Mm. I started blogging about law, so we're now into the you know two thousands. Yeah, yeah. I, I started blogging about law and about uh, hourly billing and how it was terrible that lawyers charged two hundred pounds an hour and. They didn't do anything and all this kind of carry. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I walked around that law firm as if I owned the place. I mean, it had 150 employees, 20 partners, but I was nothing in the law firm when I joined it. It was yeah. true. But I'd had previous business experience mm. of, you know, the army, importing beer and wine, a number yeah. of other things, running yeah. restaurants, that sort of thing. Yeah. So, so I'd come a bit later in life. Mm. I was in my 30s and I'd come a bit later in life. So... I saw the law firm through completely different eyes. Yeah. And also having done the e-myth by Michael Gerber, having gone through the results accountant network and systems and processes, everything mm. was different to me. Mm. So I could see how a law firm could be a business rather than, you know, the way it was. Yeah. It was so much more efficient. Mm. It could make so much more profit. Yeah. Law firms were, you know, I mean, if you try and buy a cake, right, you can buy a cake, for five pounds, okay? Yeah. Right. Put a bit of icing on that cake, call it a wedding cake, it's now 150 pounds. Yeah, 50 pounds, wow. Yeah. Okay. You see what I mean? Mm. But, but it's a wedding cake or dress, 100 pounds, wedding dress, 1,000 pounds. 1,000 pounds, yeah. A lot of suppliers would say, right, photocopier, um, 200 pounds, photocopy to a law firm, 2,500 pounds. That's yeah. what's happening. Or... Mm. Uh, supply office supplies to a firm, hundred pounds. Office supplies to a law firm, two hundred pounds. Mm. This is I was seeing this because I remember seeing the photocopier contract and thinking, "Hang on a minute, that's ridiculous. Who did this contract?" So I'd go and speak to one of the the, the way law firms worked as they had a managing partner and a management group. 
So mm. although they had 20, 20 partners, only five of them made the decisions for all the others. Yeah. And then occasionally they'd all get together to make a decision. But that's how it worked. But mm. they were putting people in charge of things and they hadn't a clue. So there yeah. was a lawyer, a lawyer in charge of the website, for example, who mm. had, didn't have a clue how websites worked. That's they, right. were, they were paying in 2005, I think this was, they were paying £28,000 a year for their website. Whoa. I, that's what they were paying. Now, I knew this because, and I was the only one who knew this. Yeah. When they wanted to put some uh, an article into the website, they would have to get the article drawn up. But because these guys were all so busy, they would pay somebody to write the article in their name. Yeah. It was 500 quid, right? Then they would give it to the, the PR company who would check it out. Yeah. Make sure they weren't saying the wrong thing and they were on message and on brand, you know, yeah. and all that bollocks, right? Uh -huh. And they would charge them 500 quid. So you've got this 1,200-word this blog article that hardly yeah. could be read that cost them 500 quid to get written, 500 quid for the PR company to look at it, and yeah. then the PR company handed it to a company who coded it to put it onto the website. For the website, and yeah. 500 quid, right? <laughs> so, and the website was absolutely rubbish. It was just a giant JPEG. It wasn't even a website. It was, the, yeah. it featured nowhere in any rankings or anything. Yeah. It was basically, a one, a, a, it was basically a, a, their, their headed paper with their address and number on it. And you couldn't yeah. even click on the number. You'd have to write the number down. And it was <laughs> absolutely awful. Mm. So uh, I said, well, look, I said, I, put me in charge of the website. And they said, well, what qualifications have you got to be in charge of the website? Well, I had one qualification. And mm. that one qualification was I knew how Google worked. I knew how Google ranking worked, mm. how Google, you know, how Google, you could check the statistics. Yeah. I, knew how, I knew how to find out how how a website performed. Yeah. That's all. That's that's all I knew. I didn't know anything else. Right? I didn't know who would write this, who would do nothing. But I knew this one thing. Yeah. So I showed them their statistics, and I showed them a rival law firm statistics, and it was like yeah. night and day. I mean, it really was night and day. Yeah. yeah. Their website was getting thousands of hits. Our website was getting 20 hits. Mm. Ridiculous. So I said, look, I can change that. I know how to change that. So one of the one of the partners then said, right, you know how to change it. How long will it take? <clears throat> and I said, probably just about a weekend. You know, you can make small changes and get a massive difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they said, right, okay, if you can get that from where it is now, where do you think you can get it to? I said, well, it's, it's at 20. I can probably get it to 1,000, which is the yeah. same as your rival firm in yeah. a short period of time. <clears throat> and they said, well, if you can do that, then you can have the task of completely revamping the website. Yeah. We'll put you in charge mm -hmm. and your budget will be less than 28,000. So the budget will be 20,000. Okay? Yeah. So mm -hmm. I thought, right, okay. Yep, challenge accepted. <laughs> so I called up the one guy I knew that knew yeah. about Brian, his name was, the one guy I knew about websites. I said, Brian, what do I do? Yeah. He said, right, we've got a plan here. We'll get you to the Google rankings. We'll get you right up the pages. He yeah. said, we're going to use black hat techniques. Mm. I don't even know what that is. He said, yeah. never, he said never mind. It will work like a dream. Said, is there a partner there that you know <clears throat> who you can, um, you can uh, tell him what's going on and he'll play along with this for a few days? Yeah. And I said, yeah, there is. There's one guy there that I know that will go along with this. I said, right, okay. He said, right, here's what we're going to do. And he told me what the plan was, right? And yeah. I went to see the partner, and I told him the plan. And he's like, no, there's no way I'm doing that. And I went, look, it's only for the weekend. We'll yeah. change, we want to change your profile for the weekend just so that we can get the rankings up. And yeah. then Monday, I swear we will take it down, and it will go back to your normal profile. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He said, you sure? You promised me now this profile is only going to be up for a weekend. I said, yes, it is. He said, yeah. right, okay, go ahead and do it, okay? <laughs> so what we did was we rewrote this guy's profile and we loaded it with keywords. Yeah. We absolutely right. loaded it with keywords. Yeah. I should have kept this thing because I, I can only remember a couple of bits of it, but it, yeah. was, it was about 200 words or something in his profile. Yeah. And in his profile, <clears throat> we wrote you know, his name, 
and he was uh, a, a lawyer in the law firm. Now, the, the, the law firm was called uh, Morrison's. I've got, I'm pretty sure I've got bookmark things. Yes. So here it is. So, I, so it looked like that M. Yeah. Right. Morrison Solicitors. It was called Morrison Solicitors. So that was the law firm. Yeah. So we called it Morrison's International Law Firm. Ah, uh, <laughs> okay. So what's the acronym for Morrison's International <laughs> Law Firm? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, can you can see where I'm going with this. Right? Yes, yeah, yeah. So we said that the lawyer worked for Morrison's International yeah. Law Firm in brackets, M-I-L-F. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we just kept putting M-I-L-F all the way through. The, yeah. The <laughs> and we said that he specialized in water sports injuries. Yeah. Anyway, it was loaded with innuendo, right? Yeah. <laughs> For those of you are listening and don't understand what's going on, it was loaded yeah. with sexual innuendo. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then as soon, as soon as we loaded that up onto the website, mm -hmm. he, he started using, you know, not Google. I, I can't remember what he did, but Google keywords, Google AdWords, something like that. He did one or two things to yeah. tweak it. <clears throat> anyway, the upshot was that when we next took the screenshot of the – the, the hits, it wasn't 20 anymore. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a thousand anymore. Yeah. It was about a hundred thousand. Yeah. <laughs> the spike just went bang. Went yeah. Bang, right? Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. But there's a thing in websites called the bounce rate. Mm -hmm. What the bounce rate is, is ex it's expressed as a percentage. And a bounce rate means that someone's gone to a website, they've realized it's the wrong website. Yeah. So so they close down the browser, they just come back out of it. Yeah. So anybody that has a bounce rate of more than 50%, it, it, they need to do something to, to change their marketing or their AdWords or whatever, or their keywords. They have to change it. Okay. Mm -hmm. We had a bounce rate of 99.4% or something. <laughs> so people, people who'd seen this clicked on it and then. Yeah. This isn't the site I'm looking for. Yeah, okay. I'm in Scotland. I'm in the <laughs> And then just came out of it, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, the partners I was presenting to, they had no idea what a bounce rate yeah, the bounce rate is. Yeah. Well, our bounce rate before on the screen, it yeah. showed 20 bounce rate 8% or something. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now we had 100,000 hits and a bounce rate of 99 point something percent. So yeah. I put this up on the, the flat screen in the boardroom and said, look, look, I told you we knew what we were doing and look at the bounce rate. How wonderful is that? And they were yeah. Oh, this is great. You, you must know what you're doing. You're in charge of the website. <laughs> That's classic. <laughs> that was pretty much my uh, my yeah. uh, my brush with the law. And um, because the bounce rate is so high, I mean, the technical people associate a higher number with good things, don't they? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not hits. I mean, you know, yeah. the number of people looking at the thing. Anyway, <clears throat> yeah. sorry, I'm going, I'm rambling on a bit here, but. <laughs> That's, that's well, that's I suppose, uh, you know, wealth and mindset. So finishing yeah. the, uh, with the law firm. Hmm. Um